Thank you. So good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our new and our regular attendees to our webinar, Project Risk Analysis, Benefit or Burden. Uh, for, the, for those of you who are attending for the first time, my name is Michael Trumper. I'm one of the principals here at Entaver Institute and have been in the area, involved in the area of project and risk management and software development for around 20 years. Before we start, I would just like to go over some housekeeping um, and how you can participate in the webinar. I'm just going to check. I've just got a sorry. I just got a message that there's no sound. Hello. Okay. It looks like it's it's been resolved. Um, sorry about that. So uh, up on your top right-hand screen, you should see this little pane allows you to uh, select uh, the audio that you're uh, you're getting. I always recommend in the mic and speakers um, that come with your computer if you have that available. It seems to be uh, a bit better quality than we get over the telephone. Um, you should also see in that panel, there's a questions panel. Now, during the, excuse me, during the uh, webinar, if you have any technical questions or you have an issue like we did with the sound or someone couldn't hear us, let me know uh, and we'll try and resolve that during the webinar. Uh, other than that, if you do have questions that have come up, we will uh, We'll answer those at the end of the session. We'll have a Q&A. Generally, it's pretty short. Um, we may have more questions today, and I'll answer them in the order that they come in. <clears throat> so, if you looked at when you signed up, you might have seen what the agenda is, what are the general goals of project risk analysis, what are the potential benefits and burdens. You might have some idea about where I'm going to go with that one. Uh, when should risk analysis be performed and how should risk analysis be performed to maximize its value? Some of those are a bit touchy-feely. Um, so when we talk about it, generally these webinars uh, are fairly informal presentations on popular topics or features that our users have asked about. Uh, in today's webinar, we're going to actually shift a bit from what we normally do. Um, so the focus is not going to be on our software or technical issues around project risk analysis or and management, uh, but on a question that we often hear, you know, why should we be doing project risk management? Um, and so we're going to just share some insights that we've uh, garnered over the years and maybe they will help you out uh, for those of you who are uh, thinking about bringing in a process to your uh, companies and how you might answer the, this question when it's posed to you. I have one little anecdote. Um, that came down and really affected about how I uh, addressed this question. A few years ago, we started working with a company that was in the process of rolling out a more formal and rigorous program management processes. Um, this included uh, not only project risk analysis, but also earned value, and I imagine some other, um, other pieces involved, but I was really only involved in those two ones. The company was in the process of actively acquiring some smaller companies, uh, which they intended to pay for by using these processes, the earned value, project risk, and the other ones that they were bringing in uh, to increase the efficiency and profitability of their acquisitions, 
to such an extent that they would pay for these uh, acquisitions in a relatively short period of time. Uh, in reality, this wasn't what I found out. It's not just a hope, but they actually do have a track record for being able to do this. So really using these processes to tighten up the strip. So part of this process, I was traveling around to various locations to provide an introduction to the project risk management process um, as it was sort of set out by this company and our software, which they were going to be used, using to uh, uh, to use to do the risk management. Um, it was pretty tough. Uh, and on my last stop, the, the group that I ran into was really quite resistant. Uh, they didn't like the idea of having this imposed on them. Uh, they arrived late. Uh, a lot of them arrived late. A lot were inattentive. They were like on their phones or talking to other people, uh, would leave uh, occasionally. And some, I sort of got some openly hostile questions. Um, it, uh, needless to say, it wasn't very pleasant. And at lunch, I went by and I sat by myself and I was thinking, what am I going to do about this? Uh, eating, a, I think I was eating a sandwich and a, one of the participants, a, a sort of a nice old, older looking gentleman came up to me, sat down with me and uh, I can tell you, I really appreciated it at that time because I was uh, I was uh, slightly depressed about the whole thing, and uh, we sat by and we had you know a little bit of small talk, and uh, I was starting to think that this perhaps this guy was going to be someone that I could depend upon um, during the rest of the class, that he would you know be a support if I asked him to you know questions or or something like that. But then he looked at me and said. But isn't this Monte Carlo stuff just mumbo jumbo? And I didn't know what to think, what to say. And at that point, it's got me to thinking into what, how I really need to reframe about how I talk about project mismanagement and you know how it would benefit you, maybe how it, uh, how it, uh, what the uh, burdens of it are as well. So. What are the goals of PRM? So at the very highest level, project risk management is about protection. It's protecting, uh, it's protecting the finance, it's protecting your stakeholders, whoever they are, whether it's a project team, whether it's the uh, sponsors, uh, internal, external, it's protecting them. It's protecting them financially. It's protecting their reputation. And it's protecting other things. I thought this a hard hat saying safety, uh, but it could be um, regulatory, could be legal, uh, other things. But it's giving us a uh, an additional level of protection around that to ensure that the project uh, delivers on time and on budget within the, and has the features that it's uh, or the within the scope that it's uh, set out. So what does it do? It, the goal is that we want to improve predictability. So how much is it going to cost? What, how much could it probably cost? How much? Will, how long will it take? Uh, reputations again. If you have, if you're uh, consistently having uh, projects that are overrunning budget or schedule, you know, delivering late, uh, it's not not delivering the features that were advertised. Uh, those sorts of things are really going to affect your, <clears throat> can affect your brand or personally can affect your reputation, you know, the reputation of, of the brand or the person. Uh, and, and on the other side, the risk management allows the goals we're talking about, we're often talking about threats here, but also provides an, a framework to identify and maximize opportunities. So how do we, uh, where's the advantage? You might be wanting first mover advantage on a market. Where are they, where, where, what, what are the things that we can take advantage of? You know, the risk and reward scenario. What can we take advantage of to be able to get us to the market sooner than our competitors?
So when I talk about benefits, I used to talk about you know Monte Carlo and confidence, and I would think, but from from my standpoint, it's really the benefit about it at a very base level is that it is a thinking exercise. It when we start to talk about project risk management or whatever else, it provides a process for a deeper examination of your project plan and objectives by all the stakeholders. And really it's about asking three questions that we do as a project in the project risk management. And it's very basic. It's saying, oh, so what could happen? What could happen that would affect our project? Typically, it's not like a giant meteorite coming down and striking the, the work site, but it could be things that could affect the project. What would be the impact if that, if that occurred? So that's that, a lot often we call it the if-then description. If this occurs, then this will happen. And then we can say, well, what are we going to do about it? So how are we going to manage it and control it? So three questions. And what it does is allows us right at the big, right when we're starting the, the project is to have this conversation about the project and in an informal, depending on how big the project is or a formal process, but we're going to start thinking deeply about what could happen and how are we going to manage it in such a way that we can deliver it on time and on schedule, on, on budget. And the other thing I think it does is at a very high level, it fosters communication. And communication is one of the biggest threats. Um, lack of communication is one of the biggest threats that you'll find in projects. So anything that encourages uh, open lines of communication and provides another avenue of communication amongst your stakeholders, amongst your project team, uh, will increase the probability of project success, however you're managing, uh, however you're measuring that. So at a, <clears throat> I'm going to sort of go down a bit into the weeds here. And even though I said I wasn't going to go too much into the software, but these are some standard sort of views that you will see out of our software. You might see out of uh, other uh, similar sort of packages. Um, sort of on the, and I look at these as qualitative and quantitative. Uh, at the qualitative side, we're, we're going to be able to sort of assess our risks. So we want to be able to prioritize really what qualitative risk is doing is we're prioritizing or assessing our risk, seeing which ones that will have the biggest impact. And then we're putting out plans. So on the right top right corner, we've sort of got a mitigation plan there with various steps that will reduce that risk over time. So, and on the quantitative side, one of the things that we might be looking at providing <clears throat> is uh, one of the things you can do is you can start to get a sort of a risk adjusted plans. Um, you can see what our original plan looks like and what it looks like with, with risk. So we can see it at schedule or we can see it at cost. And on the bottom bottom right, I'm just it's a little sort of way of looking at, uh, we have our most likely, which is that top peak on that histogram. And then we've sort of said that area, that shading area is where our uh, we, we could set our management, or, or sorry, our cost contingency at that. So maybe P80 is a really standard one. So um, qualitatively, we're sort of looking at prioritizing, assessing, identifying, prioritizing risk, and being able to put in the monitoring uh, and control, sort of plans and control. On the quantitative side, we're sort of getting more down into that, saying, well, what does what does that what does that impact really mean? And how can we account for it? How can we put in enough contingency, sort of a risk informed contingency or margin that we can, uh, we can deliver on time on budget? And these are not uh, 
no, they're not discrete. They each one of these top and bottom qualitative quantitative they inform each other. So you might you know instead of having that arrow up and down, we could have had a circle. But they do inform each other. So this should be very simple representation of what happens. Uh, one of the benefits of risk, and I say I always talk about um, early, is you want to minimize the cost of risk. And the best way to do that is to identify it as early as possible in your project. Uh, <clears throat> if we see this in the software, we'll often see this as being bugs. The later that we catch a bug, the more it's going to cost us to fix it. Uh, the same with pretty well, uh, the same overall rule applies to all projects. The later you catch that risk and have to deal with it, uh, rather than mitigating it or uh, transferring it or, or or uh, or uh, eliminating it, avoiding it altogether. Um, <clears throat> if you don't do that and you catch it very late in the cycle, it's going to cost you a lot of money, and it's going to and that could be in time, resources, and other things. And then obviously it could be a reputation or legal um, penalties. All sorts of things can happen. So this is probably in terms of you know practical um, things. This is a very simple graphic, but it does tell you that earlier we catch that risk where there's a high amount of risk, the earlier we can catch it, the easier we can, um, the better we'll be able to manage it and reduce the cost of risk. The one, one part of this when I always talk about it is that we cannot eliminate the cost of risk. Um, call that a zero risk bias, but you can't eliminate. It's always if there's risk in the project, it's always going to cost you something if you have risk. But what we want to do is minimize the cost of those risks, and we can do that best by, by identifying them early. <clears throat> uh, one of the things is I like to look at when I'm doing on the quantitative side is um, we can shift. We get a shift and, and create a more likely uh, uh, a risk. We might call it a risk-adjusted schedule or a cost or risk-adjusted project plan. But what it does on this one is that we can shift our originally on this one. It's showing the uh, what we call a deterministic on the far left, and we can see that's very unlikely to occur. We run our initial analysis, and we see our most likely is now shifted over. Um, on this one, this is on a, on a particular task, but it's shifted over so, you know, by a week or so. And that's our most likely. So what we can do is we can actually shift our plan from one to the other, and we get a, a different sort of base estimate. And the thing about that, once we shift our base estimate, uh, one of the things we talk about in our books, uh, one of the biases or things or issues that affects our estimates is anchoring. And what we want to do is shift where that anchor is so that now when we put out our three-point estimate, when we do our estimates, especially around a sort of uncertainty, a low and high estimate, rather than being on that initial uh, baseline that we had uh, over on the far left, it's going to be centered, it's going to be fixed around this most likely that we have that's moved over to the right. And if then we're going to have a more realistic estimates to go with our project planning. We start to get one of the benefits, and this is getting into the, the quantitative side, is that we, uh, as with the last one, we start to get risk-informed contingency, cost contingency, and schedule margin. And the, the reason I say risk-informed rather than uh, not, the, the alternative is a lot of times we would see in, in uh, project plans where they'll simply add 10% uh, 
onto something. 10% buffer, 10% uh, contingency, and because that becomes good enough. But what that happens then is that what does 10% actually mean in terms of the amount of risk you have? It could be too much. And if it's if you have a very uh, low risk project, you're building um, an, a house that you've built and you've built that model hundreds of times and you've built it in a very similar location with the same suppliers, there's very little risk involved. There should be very little risk involved in that. And maybe 10% is too much. And if you have 10%, if you have too much, then that's uh, not a good use of your resources. So you've got scarce resources and you're over allocating scarce resources to cover that contingency. But on the other side, if you have a very risky project, you're working uh, new, you have new suppliers, uh, your new locations, maybe new project teams, uh, maybe you're developing a new technology, having that 10% may, may not, and uh, I always like to give these sort of conditional words, but 10% might not be enough. So what we want to do is be able to develop, develop contingency and schedule margin such that they are risk informed and they provide adequate, but not too much, Um, buffers and margin and contingency to cover the risks and uncertainties that you have in your in your schedule. So what it is is about getting the most efficient use of the resources that you have set aside. So if we have money put away for contingency, if um, we have too much, we can release that so that we have enough that we are able to use those resources that we have maybe on other projects. Uh, this is actually an older slide that we had from an oil and gas, we had an oil and gas presentation. Um, and just looking again at sort of the benefits. And this presentation, we sort of gave what we thought was a practical example of how risk management uh, was able to uh, provide benefits uh, to the oil and gas producers during the current period of low, low prices. Uh, and one of the things is, is that we often have a hard time uh, quantifying the, the benefits of a risk management. One of the things is, is that risk management oversees all of these other, on the, you can see that uh, all of these supply chain management, project, cost engineering, human resource communication management. Risk management is a sort of an Uber, uh, for lack of a better word, um, process that is involved in all of those. And what we were seeing is that um, the, the management improvements were, looking, were providing about a 5% reduction in the cost of, a, uh, uh, cost of production, which in sort of came around to about $1 per barrel, maybe a little bit more, a little bit less, depending on the uh, price at the day. But that made a big difference in which which companies were going to be able to stay afloat and which and remain profitable and which ones would be uh, stop operations. Burdens. <clears throat> so one of the things is it has to be, and this will we'll look touch on some of the, another slide. It has to be resourced properly, so I just put a little image out there of a happy team talking. Um, it can be an, it, it can be uh, expensive both in cost and time, uh, depending on what you're trying to do. Some of our workshops, we'd always have a trouble getting a risk workshop together because we'd have to get a room full of engineers uh, who are highly paid, and uh, obviously some of the uh, managers would have preferred that they were working on the what they considered working actually on the project room rather than going into a risk workshop, which was seen as a uh, almost sometimes as a perk, uh, but as a something that was not adding value. Uh, 
Um, so it can be as a burden just because of that additional cost that comes with, especially in large projects, you, you're going to have to get people together and spend some time on that. Um, it can also be seen as a, a red tape. It's a, it becomes a bureaucratic exercise. And it really, it becomes a bureaucratic exercise if you're not uh, if all you're doing is seeing it as a, another paperwork, we have to, uh, at this stage, we have to deliver this risk management plan. And it goes into, and it's filed and never seen again. And if it's seen as that, it, then it is a burden. And it is red tape. Um, and it's not going to add any value. And in those cases, a lot of times what people, and and in, psychologically, we're more averse to threats than we are to opportunities. And so when you're talking about the benefits or the burdens, people are more likely to latch around that burden part. So we need to uh, make sure that you have a, uh, that you're able to uh, communicate what you think the benefits are uh, to over, overcome people's innate aversion to cost or what they might see as a threat. Um, and when I when we talk about this, I always have a you know a couple stories about this, but uh, whereas the culture is very key to having a successful uh, process. Uh, in a previous job, um, I was working on a project and we had been we just sort of were in the process of implementing, I would call a sort of a hybrid agile process to develop software. And our product, we had a woman who was our project manager. She was extremely good. And she took full advantage of this new process to be able to really um, work, I'm going to say work the project in such a way that she was able to uh, make sure that they would be, they knew about the risks. They uh, um, had a good understanding of what the resources required, where the uh, where they thought the bottlenecks occurred. And what happened is she was, she kept going through these iter iterations and in project initiation and elaboration. And she went through a few more elaboration stages than the management was happy. They kept pushing her to launch construction and, and get on with the job that she was doing because they didn't see what they were doing as part of the job. Uh, but she persisted and she pushed back against the management. The end result was that was the only, the first at that time, the only software product that was developed on time and on budget in that company while I was there. And to reward her, they promptly fired her. So you can imagine here was someone who actually did what we were being, we had been taught to do or were being asked to do, actually went through it and actually was successful at it. But because um, part of it was some, there was some personality, um, but then they fired her. And you can imagine what happened in the uh, team. No one was going to be willing to stick their neck out again. None of the project managers going to stick their neck out again to go through all of this process, not the recommended process to ensure these things, if management was telling them to get on with it. So um, <clears throat> quite a failure. Another one that uh, that ties in sort of a personal thing is uh, at one of the risk uh, sort of conferences I go to, I sat in on a presentation and they talked about um, American auto, auto manufacturers and the real problem that they had in the 1970s and where quality was awful. And in one of the organizations, they used to have these meetings, that project status meetings that we'd go in. And I think they had a sort of a process where it was green light, yellow light, red light, and meaning that everything is okay. Uh, you know, yellow, blah, red light, I need something's going wrong, I need help. And inevitably in every one of those meetings, and this is because of the culture, everything was green light. Everything was green. Everyone, uh, everyone was doing well, except when the product was delivered and they had all sorts of, you know, quality issues, 
cars might explode if you hit them the wrong way. I don't know if the tires fell off, but they had a real problem and were getting absolutely killed by imports that had a much higher quality. Um, and it wasn't until actually one of the managers, higher level management came in and encouraged people that they wouldn't be punished if they said, hey, my, my project is, is red. I'm behind budget. I have trouble. I need help. I need help. And as soon as they were able to get past that culture where admitting failure, admitting problems was seen as a, a failure and an impact of your career, but encouraging people to communicate that they needed help, that there were problems, that they saw a dramatic turnaround in the quality of the cars they were producing, the product they were producing. My own personal anecdote on that is that uh, when I was going to university, my mother bought one of those cars prior to this turnaround, <clears throat> brand new, and it was in the shop literally every four to six weeks coming out. And something was always going wrong. Um, and finally, uh, my mother decided she'd had enough of it. And it was not all that old, hadn't been driven that much. And she wanted to go trade it in. And they would not give her, the, the dealer who knew about these cars wasn't going to give her very much money for it. So she gave it to me. And uh, on my first major road trip, I was a university student at the time. We would head it out to a place called Banff for the few years. And I drove it out there with some friends. And this car had 80,000 kilometers on it, about 50,000 miles. Um, a couple, maybe two, three, three years old, four years old, and had been maintained, was in the shop all the time, and the main engine bearing blue in the middle of Banff. And that was the end of that car for me. I ended up leaving it, and my brother in law came and picked it up for me, who lived closer. Um, after the fact, I found out that their strategy. That company's strategy was that they weren't going to do any rigorous testing of the product. They were actually going to road test them using their customers. But, and here was their mitigation strategy, if you want, that they were going to provide a really robust warranty so that if something did go wrong, that they would fix it. So that was their way of uh, that was their quality assurance program at the time, or part of it. Um, so because of that, my mother was uh, was constantly without a vehicle. Um, it lasted probably four or five, five years less than we thought it would. Uh, and I, myself and my family members, have never bought that brand again. So we will never ban. And if I ever have, and this is going back two or three decades, uh, we will, uh, I still am unconvinced that they've done anything. So whenever we have a discussion about buying from or friend or anything, I bring up this story. So <clears throat> um, risk management done badly. So when do we do it? At project kickoff. Otherwise, you might miss your opportunity. Um, my mantra around project risk management is when you do it, you do it early and you do it often. Um, there is some data that suggests that if you do not, if, uh, if you're 15% within the uh, project completion and you're having, you're deviating from the project plan, you're over schedule, you will not be able to fix it. So the only way that we can make sure that we don't and do that is that we have to do it early because if you decide that at your, rather than a kickoff, if you're doing it at 50% um, design or wherever you're at, you might be, it could possibly 
be too late to um, to impact to uh, impact the sketch the project in the way that you want it to. So take away from this uh, early and often. What does often mean? Well, and this this is a an older slide that we had that looks at the risk management. Um, and I have this little icon, a group of icons that look at that. And when does it occur? Well, it, it occurs at every, you should be doing it at every major milestone of your project. So start, this is sort of a simplified sort of milestones. Um, <clears throat> informally, it should be done continuously uh, during regular project status meetings, having a little round table about, well, you know, have you, how's your risk? Um, have you, man, you know, have you uh, completed your risk management plan? Do you have anything, anything that's bothering you? Uh, the formal dedicated process, uh, again, should be at the major milestones and really should be scaled to how large your project is and timing. So <clears throat> on a very large project, it might be that you're just, you're doing one of each sort of major uh, work package delivery or, or, or such. So, and how much? That's another question we get. Well, <clears throat> so we want to scale it. Um, based on the size and importance of your project. So for, for a very small project, really, um, a simple checklist might be sufficient. Have we done this? Do we have our materials? Do we have uh, team members in place? You know, a little checklist could be very helpful. And, and um, do not put it over, you know, overly burden the, the project team with too much work just on something that's very, very small. Um, obviously, the bigger the project gets, the additional effort that's going to be required. And at some point, you're going to go from, I would say, a very simple, uh, simple, qualitative, and become a bit more complex. And at some point, you're going to have that you're going to jump over to the sort of quantitative. Uh, will become useful for you. Where that is, that's sort of a judgment call. Uh, in the what we're seeing in the US now is that uh, projects that get federal funding at $20 million, they must have a project risk manager earn value process in place. So they, they just have to sort of provide a little bit of proof that they're um, they're doing something. They have a risk register. Um, they have risk management plans in place. They might be having some uh, monthly or quarterly reporting. At $50 million, then they have to have a certified process. So they have to have some someone have come in and certify that their uh, project management processes have been certified and fall in line with the generally accepted processes. All along the way, um, when we talk about how much we have an idea, and we discuss this in some of our in one of our books called Choice Engineering, um, it sort of a, uh, falls in line with some of the research around the nudge, or <clears throat> where we can sort of create an environment uh, that lessens the burden and makes it easier for people, or make people want to do enjoy doing these things. So that could be um, and like we said earlier, checklists are a very easy way, uh, environment to allow people to do things, uh, make sure that they're thinking about the about issues that could affect their project, and that they're and they they're managing them. Uh, could be about incentives. Uh, it could it could be uh, pieces where you're properly incentivizing people to. Uh, admit to, pro to that they have some risks or problems and to bring them forward as soon as possible rather than hiding them. So it's a very cultural thing. 
And the amount of effort you want to put in that really going to scale on, again, size and um, <clears throat> importance of the project. So if you have a, it may be that you have a smaller project, but it has uh, significant import. You might be going into a new market. You might be delivering a new type of technology. Um, projects like that, then you're probably going to up the scale of that, make sure that there's a bit more oversight going on in terms of how you're managing your project, how you're managing those risks, uh, to ensure, again, that you're, you're giving yourself the best chance to be successful. So in closing, uh, this is one of the favorite sayings that uh, one of uh, a, a friend and uh, really uh, smart guy named Glenn Alleman has in his blog, uh, Herding Cats, uh, risk management is how adults manage projects. Okay, uh, by Tim Lister, who is one of the sort of thought leaders in the in the area. Um, but that's something that, uh, you know, if you're going to put something up on your wall in the project, in the lunchroom, <clears throat> this might be a little quote, if you're into that, that you could put up because it really does tell what, uh, what we're doing when we're doing risk management. It's, risk management is inherent in all of our activities. And, if, uh, and it's how, as in a mature organization or mature practice, practitioner, are going to manage the projects. So at that point, if anyone has any questions, uh, I'd be happy to I'd be happy to uh, answer them at this point. Uh, other than that, uh, we'll, we'll uh, end the session. Just uh, our three books that we have out right now. If you <clears throat> are interested in, in this and want to learn more about it, we have lots of information on our website, uh, white papers and articles, uh, online tutorials that we have. Uh, we have a new uh, series of tutorials and videos that have just been released with the release of uh, our version 7. And we have a, what we call our non-commercial site, which is called projectdecisions.org, which has a lot of uh, resources around project decision analysis. Um, you can always contact me at uh, my, my contact detail, mtrumpredandgaber.com. Uh, there's my number. That's the office number. I just had someone ask me the one question is to go back. We will be, we are recording this presentation and we will be posting it up on our site, a recording, if you want to look at it later, on our site uh, in uh, about 48 hours, it should be up. Okay, well, thank you very much everyone for attending and I hope you enjoyed it. If you do have any uh, topics that you would like to discuss in future webinars, Please feel free to contact me and, uh, and we'll put it in the queue.